Hi, it is Sam from Paper Knot Books. I'm here to wrap up the books that I read last week from October something to the 31st-ish. Hi, I am here with Mimo, who's passed out. He's probably gonna get up and wander off. But anyway, <laughs> I'm here to wrap up my week, which was the last week of Fortnite Frights, and we're gonna talk about that. I completed five books last week. They were lovely. Not a good word for this, but anyway, let's just jump in and discuss them. Well, I'm gonna discuss them. The first book I completed last week was Rebecca by Daphne de Maurier. This is a book about an unnamed protagonist and she is a lady's companion for this woman, this American woman, and she meets Mr. De Winter, who is this guy who's got a, I guess he's got a mysterious past. His wife had just recently died and she was drowned and her name was Rebecca. And he hits it off with this woman and he takes her back to, well, they get married. <laughs> he takes her back to Manderley, which is where he lives in England, and she goes through a series of being haunted by the kind of like the ghost of Rebecca, but it's really the idea of Rebecca. She's kind of haunted by all this, and then there are things that are revealed about Rebecca's past that come to a head probably about like two thirds away into the book, and things take off from there. It's very mysterious and thrilling. It is a gothic kind of like a horror thriller type book, I guess. It's very good. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I think I gave it, what did I give it? Um, I gave Rebecca five stars because as much as, so first I love the writing. I know for some people it's going to be kind of slow because it's very detailed, but it's lovely and it keeps you guessing, kind of. I kept speculating as to what was going to be happening next, and I was always wrong. So that surprised the crap out of me, considering this book was written in the 30s. Other authors have written things that are comparable to Rebecca. None come to mind off the top of my head, but I've most certainly read thrillers that I, you could kind of guess what's going to happen next. And you'd go figure that there, the book would be super tropey, and that it would be easy to determine the ending before you even get too far into the book, but no. So I was constantly surprised and I enjoyed this book thoroughly, so I gave it five stars. Next book I finished. This was actually going, there was going to be a discussion on with um, Seiji over on the Fortnite Frights. She ended up canceling the event because she had a lot of personal issues that were going on at the time and it's, it's actually quite heartbreaking. I'm not going to link you to her video but I'm going to link you to her account so you can go and take a look and see what she has going on but um, I did read The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones and this book <laughs> so this book let me tell you you go into it for the horror you stay for the writing for the voice this story is about four young men in their mid-twenties, they go on a hunting trip and something happens. Fast forward 10 years later and there's some sort of an element that is coming after these guys. It's haunting them. It's haunting me. <laughs> it's graphic and scary and wicked good. That's all I can tell you. I am doing the synopsis of this book no justice. This is about an Indian tribe called the Blackfoot, and they, well, the, the guys from the, are from that tribe called the Blackfoot, and they are being haunted by some supernatural element. What I loved about this book was the author's voice that comes through. It is such a well-crafted narrative that it's, it's this casual storytelling style that I am attracted to. And it wasn't until reading this book that I realized that this is like the common thread for all the books that I've loved this year. 
Um, you see it in Oval and in Geek Love and in Girl, Woman, Other. They all have a very strong narrative voice and this book is exactly that. This is exactly the kind of book that I'm looking for. I definitely want to read more of his books. Um, from his, He's got a, a number of other novels. Uh, I'm nervous because they are all horror or in that scary realm and I'm like a chicken so one should be surprised that I managed to get through this trigger warnings for this book there's a lot of hunting language in here so as much as I get it um, it's gonna be gory and graphic but there's also a lot of animal abuse which is harder to handle <laughs> in some ways I f understand that Kayla Books and Lala has this as their November pick for the Literally Dead book club. I'll link you to her. And, and there's a Goodreads page as well as, I mean, I'll link you to Kayla. You probably already follow Kayla anyway. So I highly recommend reading this, especially if you're interested in joining in with the book chat for Kayla's group. Um, go for it. It's wicked good. Next book I completed was 10 Days in a Madhouse by Nellie Bly. Nellie is a, I think like late 19th century, early 20th century journalist. I'm not 100% sure on her timeline, but she t took on a task to get herself admitted into a mental institution and write a, to like observe and see what's going on there because it's kind of mysterious and they don't really know what's going on there. Um, that's the premise of this book. What you get <laughs> is Nellie trying to figure out how to get into the mental institution for mm, at least 50% to 60% of the book and then her casual observations of things that have gone on in the institution which is heavy abuse and down to like, unsanitary living conditions and people who are in there who really should not be. The book feels more like a generalization of what she went through, with exception to the beginning part when she's trying to get into the um, into the institution. Anyway, it did feel diluted, and um, that just the writing in general felt diluted to me. I ended up giving this three stars just because, again, harking back to what I was just talking about, the voice of the narrative just isn't. It felt kind of pretentious and uh, classist. That was the general feeling that I got from the book. So while it did do some good for hospitals at that time, there's still a recurring issue. In fact, I would like to read The, the Great Pretenders next because uh, it deals with the same topic. It's people, journalists, going into mental institutions and trying to get back out. But it seems that the biggest problem that these people had was that there were a lot of people that did not belong there and it seemed that uh, a number of them were actually just immigrants coming off because they're, they're right off Ellis Island. They were immigrants that had lost their way or they couldn't communicate well so they ended up just in a hospital in to be abused. It, it's horrifying. Some of the content is difficult to consume but it's not she kind of glazed it over to a point where it was just, it felt reduced and didn't quite feel authentic enough for it to be journalist. So three stars, it's okay. It does do some, it, it does make a point of making sure that these hospitals are held accountable, but did, was there any follow through? I don't think so. Somehow I think that she just did this assignment and then boop, that's it. On to the next project. Next book, The Vegetarian by Hong Kong. This book follows three narratives that are, they're about one character, one Hoi, who is, she has a series of dreams and they are so graphic and horrifying that she ends up becoming a vegetarian and she just scratches meat out of her diet entirely. And this affects her marriage. Uh, the first story actually follows her husband and his take on what is going on with his wife. And she, there's also some like dribbles of her dream sequences in the book, in this story. 
And then the second story follows her brother-in-law, who's an artist, and the third narrative of the third story in this book follows her sister. I had some questions about the book as well as other readers and someone had asked if, because um, I was curious about the timeline, like when this took place, because vegetarianism is very common and it feels like it was such a taboo item and apparently that is not common as a Korean diet, so it's um, less common to find a vegetarian in Korea apparently, or according to other readers. So let me know if I'm wrong, or if you are Korean or from Korean descent. That would, I would love to know because that's, why are these people so abusive? This book does get dark. It's, I mean, it's dark pretty much right away because you're getting some of her dark dreams. There is a bit of abuse, uh, spousal rape and animal abuse, as well as it touches on the topic of anorexia. So. I gave this four stars. I absolutely love the writing. I was surprised that I liked the writing so much because it is a translated work, but it still comes across as super dreamy and um, surreal, almost fabulous, but it's not. It's, I think just because of the sequence from the artist, that's just, there's something so, I don't want to call it romantic, but it's, it's actually really beautifully written. Um, let me see who translated this. This was translated by Deborah Smith. So, thank you, Deborah Smith. You did a great job, but I can see why. Um, in my Goodreads list, people have varied degrees of how much they liked or hated this book. I'm kind of like in the upper middle part. Well, some of the content is graphic and horrifying. I absolutely love the writing, and I just, it needs those kudos, so four stars for me. The last book I completed this past week, When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole. This is a book about gentrification and it also deals with some other dark elements which occur towards the, the two-third point of the book. So the story follows two narratives. One is Sydney. She's a black woman who lives, she's always grown up in this brownstone um, neighborhood and she's moved back from California I believe and she's living with her mother or she's taken over her mother's residence while her mother is sick and really not doing very well. What she notices is that there are people that keep they're uprooting and leaving and she is involved with a block party that's going to be happening at the end of this week and she is going to be setting up a like a, a an area tour a neighborhood tour she's trying to find historical facts about their neighborhood and she's doing research for that she enlists the help of her new neighbor Theo who is the white man who lives directly across the street from her he is living with his girlfriend Kim who is a pain in the ass and a half and he's out of work, so he has all the time that he can kill for, you know, to help uh, Sydney with this project. And he's kind of getting the wind that there's something creepy and weird going on. He's noticing a lot of the racism that's going on between the, the new neighbors who are all white and how they are starting to get clicky and not integrate themselves with the the existing black community and that's where the story takes off. These neighbors that are leaving, they are just suddenly leaving and it is, it, it does seem like it's all of a sudden, especially when you have the man who's in orchestrating the entire block party just suddenly disappears. That's creepy. So yes, this book gets very dark, very scary towards the end and uh, it actually deals with other topics that have uh, been influenced from black history. So bear that in mind. If you liked Riley Sagar's Lock Every Door, you're gonna love this just as much. This is better written though because I think the characters are a lot more solid. They actually have personality that is believable. I gave this four stars maybe four and a quarter. It's really good and very uh, something else. <laughs> so now that Mimo's cleaning himself, I'm done here. 
Uh, that is everything that I read this past week, so I had a great reading week. Would you like to know what I'm reading next? Of course you would. You should subscribe to my channel because that video is forthcoming.